must come to an end. More, what's that song? The party's over. <laughs> Had a nice time here this week, second year in a row. And if America's still here next year, if the Lord's in it, maybe we can do it again. If I don't bomb out tonight. And, uh, you know, you never know what's around the corner. Driving to church tonight, I got a text message from the pastor that I'm speaking for next who's in Branson, Missouri. I'll be there a week from uh, this coming Sunday, Brother Lord Sunday, but then I fly home Monday. And uh, my schedule was calling for me to go out to Branson, Missouri Friday. And we, uh, this church has some street preaching on Saturday that I normally uh, participate with, then preach all day Sunday and come home Monday from there. But anyway, they have a newspaper in that town. You know, that's a big tour town. That's... Uh, there we go. Pizza and Packers. Uh, how many have ever been to Branson before? How many ever heard of Branson? I mean, don't give a flip. <laughs> and, it's a, you know, it swells, big tourist town numbers out of nowhere, right? And, and so they have a newspaper in that town that goes in every hotel. It's not like so much the normal paper for the people as much as it's coupons, you know, you know the kind of promotional thing. Real first-class paper. Anyway, the church that I'm preaching in, they have a full-page ad every issue uh, with the plan of salvation, one whole page. And they get a real good rate. The, the editor of the paper is a Christian lady. And she's from Los Angeles, so she's barely saved, amen? <laughs> All kidding aside, we cut up with a little bit. A land of fruits and nuts kind of thing. A very sweet lady. And uh, long story short, I preached out there Labor Day last year, and she came to hear me preach, and Really enjoyed it. It was, it was coming back this Labor Day, uh, planning on hearing me to speak. And I just got a text message saying the poor lady died of a heart attack on Friday, and they're going to have a memorial service for her on this coming, you know, on the Friday, a week from uh, tomorrow, or a week from this Friday. So I'm going to drive out there four or five hours earlier than I normally get there to participate in that service. She was looking forward to hearing me. And that's the last thing the preacher said on his text. I read it well. We were driving into church tonight. So you, you never know what a day may bring forth. Amen. So uh, the Lord told me, impressed me to show you a verse, okay? Nothing to do with my sermon. Turn to Hebrews 13. W why were we here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night? Why, why did we spend five days here, five messages, right? Well, maybe God wanted to give you something special. You're having a special meeting. That's the idea, right? A special meeting. And so, uh, you know, do you think, I mean, do you think you got anything this weekend? Of course, everybody got something, but everybody's including the pastor. And he didn't ask me to say anything about this at all. It's, it's just simple Bible. I want you to look at Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they must give an account. That they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable unto you. I hadn't thought about this since Shep was a pup. I just thought about it just Amen. now. I was in uh, Alaska years ago in Anchorage, at Fairbanks preaching for Pastor Doug Duffett and uh, had a wild service, about three, 400 people in there. And, you know, if the devil would show up, they'd have him preach. You know, I pastored in Idaho. No, no, nothing's that. That's not even in the United States almost. <laughs> anyway, I, I printed my message and invitation and went down and sat down on my seat. And, and then Brother Duffett said, uh, Brother Grady, you got any more sermons? I'm like, no, duh. Yeah. Said, well, come on up and preach another one. Wow. I, that never happened to me in my whole ministry. I came up and preached another hour of message, right? Two in a row. People were going crazy. You know, there's nothing up there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> when it was all over, I got caught down here with. Uh, People well-wishers, you know, shaking my hand, and my book table was back there. I mean, the money was back there, you know, and I wanted to get away from it. By the way, if you don't have my books, they're still over there. No 
forget, I take debit cards, anybody's debit card. <laughs> and uh, long story short, two real spooky looking dudes come up to me. I hadn't thought about this in a million years. And they couldn't, they were pumping my hand so much. And watch out for people that compliment you too much. Flattering lips work it through, and Proverbs said. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean, Jelly Bean? So my, my antenna went up. And I said to these two spooky looking dudes, I said, how, how long have you been members here? And they said, oh, we're not members here. I said, you're not? And you say you're here almost every other week or so? I said, I, 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 they said, yeah. I said, well, what do you do here? And I remember, she said, well, we, we're teachers. We teach the Bible. Uh -huh. I said, how come you're not a member here? He said, well, we don't agree with the pastor and everything, you know. But, but they hang around and teach people when they can pigeonhole them here and there, you know. Uh -huh. I'm just telling you, neighbor, I, I haven't known about this in a million years. But I, as soon as I saw that verse that we read, the story came into my mind. And I said, man, haven't you ever read the scripture there in verse 7? And, and I quoted verse 7 and verse 17. You know, obey them that have the rule over you. The rule over you. You know, a pastor's a qualification to pastor a church, one that ruleth well his own house. Because yeah. if he can't rule his house, he can't rule, it. how can he take care of the church of God? Pastor's got to be able to do both. Yeah. Long story short, I quoted that to him. You know what those dingbats said? They, they were deeper life dingbats. You know, knew more, more about the Bible than God did. And he said, oh, he, he smiled at me. He said, oh, Brother Grady, you know that's a tribulation book, a tribulation passage. And Hebrews got a lot to do with the tribulation period. I said, "Well, is Timothy a is Timothy a tribulation book, pastoral epist uh, you know pastoral letter for the church age?" And you know, then then they kind of like worm their way out of the building. Amen. Watch out for spooky Christians. Amen. amen. Now look at here, verse seven. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Okay, does your pastor have the rule over you by way of the authority of the local church? Amen. Sure, he does. And has he spoken unto you the word of God? Amen. Has he set a right example? Amen. Considering the end of their conversation. Does he, does he live what he's preaching? Alright, what are you supposed to do about that then? It says whose faith follow. So you're supposed to follow his faith. Amen. So guess what God's going to do for him during this week, hopefully. He's going to give him visions and insight and direction and thoughts and inspiration. Where are you at, preacher? Did God do anything for you this week? Sure what about those cigarettes? Got rid, of him. got rid of him. Got rid of him. Didn't even hesitate. So maybe the Lord has put some things in his heart. So if you want to be a strong church and an obedient church and a good church, unless he's telling you to do something against the word of God, follow his faith. I have no idea where he's taking you. And uh, we're not. you may not even be able to have church after the election. Who knows? So uh, look for the Lord to do something for you in the weeks and months ahead. And the second thing, don't be surprised if the devil shows up. He's not going to mess around. If, if you're getting anything out of anything, and he's going to beat you up. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Pa Pastor's car blew up this week. What do you know about that? I mean, what are you going to do? This is called the uh, fight in the good fight of faith. Amen. And Dor Hardness is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So uh, hey, I heard an old preacher say one time, when the devil's kicking you in the pants, at least you know you're out in front. Say amen right there. And... He's standing on one leg. <laughs> all right. Let's have a... All right, so what are we going to do tonight? I've been promising you... Uh, first, I thought I was going to give you the Alexandrina sermon way out in the left field, but the Lord impressed me to do something else. And then Miss Carol almost messed the service up tonight. So I'm talking about... We got talking about the, the second coming of the Lord, so I ran back upstairs and got two of my messages on the, on the rapture. Now, I'm a little spooky sometimes. I thought the Lord was trying to speak to me about that, so there they are. When I got to church, the Lord said, hey, dummy, preach the thing I put on your heart originally. Amen. All right, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a shotgun sermon. Mm, uh, right. Pastor, I mean, Brother Todd here is a, a very violent person. He's got guns all over the house. He went out with the preacher today and shot some 18-inch shotgun barrels. and Man, that's wild. So I have a, so I have a message that's a shotgun message. It'll hit anything there is out here. Amen. So if you haven't gotten hit yet, or you just got wounded this week and you're not dead yet, Amen. you're going to get hit tonight. Amen. Is that okay? Amen. How many gluttons for punishment we got out here? Amen. Amen. All right. We're, we are going to have a good time, though. I've only been preaching a sermon for over 30 years, maybe more than that. And God always seems to bless you. Amen. And uh, so I can't wait. I, you know, I don't know if you can tell, but I passed in two churches, and I miss... 
the people of God. And these, how many old? How many old ladies? Oh man! <laughs> how many of you ladies remember that uh, Queen for a Day? Remember that old TV show? Oh, and the Pastor's mother's not ahead, but she she can't be more than thirty nine. Amen. But I get to be pastor for a day when I go to a church. I get to, you know, I miss I miss pastoring, and so I like to help God's people. And I'd rather preach pastoral stuff than the Illuminati stuff. You get that on your own. But uh, I want to help you tonight. And uh, what we're going to do, well, let's have a quick prayer. Father, I pray now that you will bless us. Thank you for the good, uh, the, the, good, the good services we've had all week. And I pray now that you will help us in this closing hour to bring a lot of this stuff together. Yes. And uh, shore, up the, shore up the good church tonight. We sure do love you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. But I pray now, uh, again, one more time. It's new manna. Yes. New manna. Yesterday's uh, is, is gone. Yes. So speak to us tonight and, and, and help the people of God get closer to you. Now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, I'll give you a sword drill tonight. I'm going to ask you two questions. Of all the things that God will provide for our Christian life, so we can do the things we've got to do, right? Spiritual provisions. What do you think is the most important one you need or the most important one he'll give you if you're fortunate enough to get it? You know, you need faith. You need patience. You know, perseverance. How many things do you think you need? You need all kinds of things. Uh, compassion. All the various uh, spiritual traits that we need to have and work into our life to be a well-rounded Christian, right? What do you think is the most important one? So when you get that down... I want you to pick one in the back of your brain now. And don't yell it out, but see if you get it right, because we're going to look at it. And then pick a pick a backup. Like if you if your semi-automatic pistol jams, you need a good revolver somewhere. Amen. And uh, get you a second choice in case you bombed out on the first guess. So get at least two of them. And we're going to see how spiritual you are tonight. Maybe you're going to find out you need this message. And after that, I'm going to ask you a second question. Well, let's, let's get the first one done and see if you get it right. And then we'll go to the second question. All right? All right. So everybody got one down in your mind? Mm -hmm. All right, let's find out if you got it right. Turn over to Proverbs chapter uh, blah, blah, chapter 4. And once I said that, I really let the cat out of the bag, probably. Proverbs chapter 4. Let's look at uh, verse number 5. Proverbs 4, verse 5. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is, here's, here you go, the, what's the next word? Principal, Principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. <laughs> How many of you remember your principal when you were growing up in school? You know who that was? That was the one person you didn't mess with. Mm -hmm. You know who the principal was? The big boss with the hot sauce. <laughs> uh, I remember the Jerry Blavitt, the big famous disc jockey in uh, Philadelphia when I was growing up as a kid on the radio. The geeter with the heater, they called him. The big boss with the hot sauce. Anybody remember him? You wouldn't know him. No, pair, no English. He was a top enchilada. The principal. You didn't mess with the principal. Uh, I, my principal was Sister Beatrice, first grade nun at St. Stephen's of Hungary Catholic School, and you did not mess with her. She'd clock you in Jesus' name. All those, how many had an old-fashioned nun growing up? You didn't. They, they were crazy, man. They used to beat us at St. Stephen's. Uh, all the Nazis were, were Catholics. I hope you know that. Man, they used to make us kneel on pointers. You know, they take a round point and put it up. No, no. They, they, they put pencils on the ground. Two pencils on the ground and make us kneel on both pencils. You know, hand on our back. Kneel there for 10, 15, 20 minutes. They were crazy, man. And uh, they were uh, like uh, concentration camp guards, Gertrudes and all them people. And, but my dad was a bookie and a, and a loan shark and a bartender for the Gambino family. He was, he was wild. He used to, uh, he knew how to, you know, buy off people, amen? They called it the envelope. And I remember the first, the first day in the in first grade, the principal was the first grade nun I had as well. And he, he came and, and had me give her a big old box 
I mean, the first day walking in, hello, you know, had a big old gift wrap box like this. And you take the gift wrapping paper off, it was a little dresser with drawers. You pull the drawers. And Sister Beatrice was a little, you know, I mean, at the trash cans, you know, size, amen? And man, did her eyes light up when she saw those uh, candies. But uh, that ran out in about two and a half months, amen? I said I was in trouble at the after, 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 after. I don't know what class I was in. I don't know if it was her or some other crazy nun, but you remember I used to put the uh, little containers of milk and little orange juice containers yeah, for a recess, yeah. put them under the chalkboard and read there yeah. to break it. Well, we used to have like a pyramid, you know, like 10 and then 8 and 6 and 2 and 1. You know, stack them up that way. I got some nun got to have me for something. I'm talking about second grade kind of stuff. He grabbed me by the hair. And she just back and forth and back and forth and then let me do, let me go like a bowler <laughs> Bang into those you know little containers I'm laying on the ground and all that and I and I and I hadn't even got to high school yet with all the pedophile priests. I'll tell you about that. Oh, man. This is just grade school, Miss Brett. But I still remember Sister Beatrice. You never mess with her because she was the principal. And this King James Bible says that wisdom is the principle of your life. It's the thing that's supposed to run you. It's the principal thing. Of all the things you need in the Christian life, you need wisdom more than you need anything else. You'll get wisdom. It's like the hub of the wheel. You'll get all of the other spiritual traits that you need. They'll come out of that hub. Now, I wonder, don't raise your hand, but I wonder if you got wisdom, you picked the right answer, and if you got it on the second shot. And see, I'm not going to ask you. I know the pastor got it. Pastor's always going to get it. We never mess him up. He, he controls the love offering. Say amen right there. <laughs> all right. Now let's go to the second one. Of all of the spiritual priorities that we have in our life, the things we're supposed to do, what do you think is the most important one you're supposed to do? Of all the spiritual priorities, what's your most important practice? You got to pray. You got to read your Bible. You got to go to church. You got to give. Got to give the gospel to people. You know there's a zillion things. Do you know which one is the most important one? Why don't you pick one and then pick your back up again? You're all looking depressed. I know none of you got the first two, the first one right. That's okay. Let's try for the second one. You'll find out maybe you're glad you come to church tonight and you need that. Some people think uh, going to church on Wednesday is a waste of time. Give me a break, neighbor. The old expression is three to thrive. You need Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, and Wednesday night church. Three to thrive been around since the book of Acts. Right. Amen. Yeah. The church of Thessalonica, the church of Rome. You ever read those things? All right, so let's see if you're going to pass the test. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Are you ready, neighbor? We'll see how smart you are, spiritually speaking. Colossians 3. Let's start out here around verse 12. Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. All right? You're, you're supposed to practice mercy in the Christian life with one another especially, right? All right, that's important, isn't it? And uh, Todd, quit reading ahead. I can, I can feel it. All right? Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and for, for, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, right? Look at verse 14, neighbor. And above all these things, put on what? Charity. Charity, which is the bond of what? Perfect. Above all of those things that are important, put on charity. Because if you get that, brother, you've got the bond of what? Perfect. Charity is like the hub of the wheel. Everything goes off of that. Look here, neighbor. Somebody said, if you are what you ought to be, you'll do what you ought to do. The most important thing you need to become what you ought to be is wisdom. If you get wisdom, you'll get all the other things you need to get. And then you're going to be able to do what you ought to do. And of all the things that you need to do in the Christian life, the most important thing you need to do is to practice charity. Because if you're practicing charity, you will ultimately be able to practice 
all of the other things you're supposed to do. You need wisdom more than you need anything else so that you can perform charity more than any other thing. If you are what you ought to be, you'll do what you ought to do. But you may be, there may be a skeptic in the room. I can feel him. And he's over here. Uh, he's close to the front. He's not the woman in the front. Not over here. <laughs> now, I'm going to miss that accordion, I'm telling you. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. We just read with the Holy Spirit. Impress Paul to write in Colossians. And go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And watch how the Holy Spirit puts these things together perfectly. 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, look down here at about verse 7. And this is interesting, but the end of all things is at hand. That's that transition gospel period. When, when, that's not the end of the church age, because Paul's the spokesman for the church age. And the, and the church age didn't end in Peter's time. And this is the time, you know, Paul, you know, the book of Acts says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That was a command given to the Jews, I mean, to the Jews there in the early part of Acts. You've got to keep that Bible rightly divided. Look at verse 6. Uh, I mean, uh, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. All right, there's two things mentioned there. As far as spiritual priorities, we're supposed to be sober-minded. And we're supposed to uh, be people of prayer, correct? All right, among other things. I mean, how many, you could probably write 50 things down the Bible would teach you you should be doing. But look what the Holy Spirit says in verse 8. And above, uh, Paul said, above, all, above, above these things. Look what verse 8 says. And above, what's the next word? All things. Not just the list he's just giving. Above all things, uh, Brother Smith. Have, didn't say charity. Paul said charity. Peter says fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Isn't that interesting? Hey, we're not done yet. Uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul's going to tell those uh, uh, folks there in, in the first chapter what the purpose for the law was. The purpose for the law. What are the great truths Sammy Allen taught? Mm -hmm. Don't ask people when do you first remember getting saved. When do you when do you first remember being lost? Right. That will blow more people's minds. Yeah. You know what they'll say? Yeah. And, what, and another way used to put it: When do you first remember having come under conviction? That will blow more people's minds. You know what they'll say? I don't want to, I don't want anything about conviction. Right. I know in a youth camp, a whole bunch of us kind of went up to the altar and had a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's why. That's why Oliver B. That's why. Listen to this, uh, 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 R. G. Lee, pastor of the Bellevue Baptist Avenue Baptist Church there in Memphis. I think that was the church. I mean, he was he, he was he pastored the largest. I'm having a lot of Joe Biden moments tonight. Uh, he was the most he was the most famous Southern Baptist pastor in the in the 20th century. He used to say he thought 80 percent. Of the membership, eighty percent of the membership of the Southern Baptist Convention was unsaved. Uh, the uh, G, uh, J. Harold Smith preached that famous sermon, "God's Three Dental." He's the most famous Southern Baptist evangelist in the twentieth century. He used to, he thought ninety percent of the Southern Baptist Convention membership was unregenerate. I was outside there talking to somebody, one of you guys, and uh, I said, "If this was a Southern Baptist church or a dead Methodist church, everybody be out here smoking right now." He said it's not Sunday morning. <laughs> a lot of lost people in the church house. Yeah. And so, uh, but that law, the, you know, the law of Moses meant to show you how far you're, you're, you're short, how far you're uh, short you're falling. And uh, look over at verse 5. Now the end of the commandment, end meaning the goal, the purpose. Now the end of the commandment is what? Charity. Charity. Out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Those commandments and the moral code of God and everything to do with the Word of God in general is meant to get you to the place of charity. Now watch. No kidding. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to act like you know you're not real smart or anything. But I bet you, quarter eighty to ninety percent of you really don't know the Bible definition for charity. And all these dingbats want to correct the King James Bible twenty four hours a day. Uh, they want to. Uh, you have a. Is there a whole chapter in the New Testament on the subject of charity? First Corinthians chapter thirteen. 
First Corinthians 13, hang a left real quick. Look at one verse. They want to tell you that's love. Hey, if it was supposed to be love, it would have said love. Amen. You know the King James Bible also has the word charity, and it has charity and it has love. Two different English words. They are not the same. Amen. And so I'm, I haven't told you what charity is yet. But it is not love. And the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are not the same thing no matter what people tell you. Right. Birds fly in the heavens. Birds don't fly in God. Right. You don't shoot missiles into God. You shoot missiles up into the heaven. Right. And the words are not the same. Things that are different are not the same. Yeah. Charity and love are not the same thing. They're cousins, but they are not the same. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. Charity is the greatest thing you can ever get into your Christian life. It's the goal of the, of the Christian life to practice charity, and, it's got no, and it is not love. You can love someone without practicing charity. For God so loved the world. There's different degrees of love. And charity is the advanced form of love. And we'll see that in just a few seconds here, but I'm trying to set the stage for you. Okay, so did you get this? Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And charity is the bond of perfectness. Yeah. One is the principal thing, and one is the bond of perfectness. Now, you, you look so excited tonight. I, I guarantee you, almost all of you, except the pastor, I guarantee you, he got both of them right. Nod your head, Pastor. <laughs> I, I see that hand. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't think many of you got it right, but... Okay, you can be sad about that, but you can be happy about the fact that you're here tonight. Yeah. Again, a lot of people don't come to church on Wednesday. They'll come Sunday, but they'll slum it in Sunday, but they won't come Sunday night or Wednesday night. Fooey on you. Now stay with me. You might learn something if you're in church. So you're here tonight. Isn't that great? Amen. So let's take a look at this thing. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. you got to get wisdom. And if you get wisdom, wisdom is going to lead you to practice charity ultimately. You see the, see the formula. So what's the key? The key would be, what's the key to start out with? Is it, is it getting wisdom? Obviously, you're going to have to figure out how to get this one first. Amen. So all you got to do is find out how to get wisdom. And there's lots of scriptures, he that walks with wise men shall be wise, you know? Uh, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God. A lot of scriptures will tell you how to get wisdom. But there's one great truth to how to get wisdom that you hardly ever hear anything about. I was say 46 years ago yesterday. Uh, today was the 46 years ago today. I walked into my office at British Airways at the Philadelphia Airport. They psyched out as the guys have ever been psyched out. Telling all my friends about the guys I work with about getting saved. They all thought I was nuts. <laughs> now, watch neighbor. I have never in 46 years heard one sermon on the next word I want you to look at in the Bible, which is the key to getting wisdom. And I've never heard a single sermon on it. You tell me if you've ever heard a sermon on it. Go back to Proverbs 4 where we started. It's going to blow your mind here, neighbor. Remember, don't mind me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a genuine preacher. I'm not a hustler or a chameleon. It's only looking for money. I'm in this for the, for the long haul. And I love it when I have a message that I know God likes to use. Amen. I've been preaching this over 30, 35 years, and God always uses it. So you're going to get something. You just kind of hang in there with me. I want you to go back to verse 5. Get wisdom, right? Look at the next thing. That's right. Get understanding. Forget it not. Verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get what? Isn't that interesting how those two words butt up against each other? It's more than just interesting. I was preaching 25 years ago in Culpeper, Virginia, Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, the pastor was up here at the pulpit making announcements. I'm sitting here in a little chair, uh, you know, killer time. He's reading announcements. And pastor, I pastor two churches. Man, there's no way to make announcements interesting. And the longer they go, the more drone gone. Amen. The only thing worse than the announcements is when a preacher says we're going to have a business meeting. Every Sunday. 
And uh, Baptists are funny. If you announce it's going to be a business meeting, the people groan. If the pastor says we're going to cancel having business meetings, the people riot. <laughs> so I'm sitting on this little chair minding my own business, and the preacher's up here promoting a Strong's Concordance that they just got in the bookstore. And so he's showing it up to the people and telling them how important the Strong's Concordance is, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then when he's all done, he passes it back over to me. Oh, no, he passes it over to the ta on the table, you know, right next to my chair. So again, he's droning on for a while. So I felt impressed of the Holy Spirit. I was getting ready to, I, I don't know what I was getting ready to preach. I don't, I don't think I had this message. I was working on this message, maybe, way long time ago. I picked up the book, and the Lord impressed me to look up the word wisdom in the Strong's Concordance in the, word, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the book of Proverbs. And count the number of references. Count the number of references where wisdom is found. And I did it while he's up there droning. I don't know why I feel talking about you today. And I'm going on down. When it was all finished, I counted that it was 54 times. So then the Holy Spirit said, Why don't you see now how many times the word understanding is found? So I looked up understanding. And then I went to the book of Proverbs specifically and counted every reference to the word understanding in the book of Proverbs. Take a guess how many times it was found in, Pro in Proverbs. 54 times. Amen. Wisdom is 54 times. Understanding is 54 times. Almost had a cow. Amen. Look at Proverbs chapter number 1 real quick. Look at Proverbs 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. What's the purpose for the book of Proverbs? To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. understanding. What about that neighbor? And you know, I used to go through a lot of these references here, but there were so many of them. I thought that, that might kill the people, but they see it over and over. I don't know, chapter 2, verse 2, So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thy heart uh, to understanding. Look at that neighbor. Uh, 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 oh, Verse uh, 9, then, then thou shalt understand righteousness when wisdom entereth into thine heart. Verse 11, discretion shall, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Uh, over and over and over again, look at verse 13, chapter uh, 3, cross the page. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. So not only are they both found 54 times, and 5 plus 4 is 9, and we know that nine in the Bible is the fruit-bearing number. That's why you ladies carry your babies nine months. We talked about that the other day. And Abraham was 99 years old when Sarah conceived. She was 90. The nines are all over the place. And, uh, and Carol's an old ex-hippie like I am, and I'm probably Todd. And do you know what just flashed into my brain? Number nine. Number nine. The Beatles. Number nine. Yeah, nine. You can't shake that old life. I'm telling you, that's not a simple thing. I was walking through the halls of Howes Anderson College one time when I was a teacher there. And I was singing that pretty Christian song, uh, Dear Lord, let it be, you know. I'm singing that. They sang in a chapel. Next thing I shifted into, let it be, let it be. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the Beatles version, but I didn't realize it all. I had 2,000 students in that school. The halls were packed, amen. And, uh, you know, I had to go hide somewhere. <laughs> All right, we don't need to go through all 54 examples, see? But not only, not only are both words used 54 times, but most of the times they're found in the same verse. Right. You can't see one without the other. Right. They go like soup and sandwiches. Right. So here's the bottom line. The bottom line is the key to getting wisdom is to get understanding. If you get understanding, you will get wisdom. And if you get wisdom, you will ultimately practice charity. And then you'll be perfect. I didn't say sinless. I said you'll be perfect, spiritually speaking. Amen. You mothers, the baby's born, what's the first thing you do? Count the digits on the hands and the feet. That's what perfect means, having all the members. You will be well-rounded. You won't be a nut. Nothing worse than a saint person who's a nut, who's, who's not balanced. Then have his act together and have it do it all. Jesus had done all things well, it said over there in the gospel of Mark. All right, so what we better do then next, remember me now, look, be honest, you don't want me to leave, right? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good night. But by now you figured out how I function. I mean, you got to pay a price. You got to hang in there, then you're going to get the blood. Do you like a scripture? 
Buy the truth and sell it now. Right. You got to pay for truth. This ain't no Obama money place. And there's no welfare stuff. This is, you got to pay. Amen. Any man would not work, neither should he. Okay? Amen. So buy the truth and sell it now. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. Workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Work is Bible study, right? right. So that's what we do in my messages here. Bing, bing, bing. Okay? So let's go to uh, Job 28. We're going to find out what understanding is. Just hang a left. A couple of verses. I mean, a couple of books, Psalms, and this is where you go when you're unemployed. Amen. Remember those days when you're a new Christian, you didn't know any of these books of the Bible. You weren't spiritual back then. Job 28. The, the, the word understanding in the King James Bible has, has two definitions. Just like a, a head and a tail on a coin. Here comes the first part of the definition. How can you forget verse 28? Job 28, 28. And unto man he said. Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is what? Understanding. Isn't that beautiful? So the first part of the definition for understanding is to depart from evil. Gee, why? I wonder what that means in Hebrew. That means like, like uh, Sam Jones, the famous method of angels in the 19th century. His favorite son, he's a converted lawyer. He's an alcoholic. He had the largest crowds in, in America. He's second only to D.L. Moody in that time, in the 1800s. His number one sermon was called Quit Your Meanness. Hey, Dad, listen, we're such sissies here. We can't even come to an altar, kneel down, and everybody's heads about, and mumble a few things and go back to your seat. Boy, in the old good old, in the, in the old Bible Belt, uh, a heyday, the old time religion days, they had quit means. Right. Stand up and tell the church what you're going to quit. Right. Publicly, get up here and tell them. Wow, days. Yeah. We're kind of with you today. Yeah. But hey, hey, whatever you're doing that's wrong, you stop doing it. Right. Yeah. To, to depart from evil. Stop doing bad stuff. Right. Amen. 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 Good. Love not the world. Yeah. Neither the things that are in the world. You know what's wrong with these sticking phones? And again, I confess, I got on Facebook because I thought that's what I gotta have in order to get my latest latest book published. But I'll tell you, I'll give you a verse of all these phones. Uh, that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination with God. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen anything that humans in America are more addicted to? Yeah, right. You don't think that this is highly esteemed among men? It's well, it's an abomination of God. Right. Doesn't mean it's a sin for you to have one. But just keep that in the back of your mind when you're tempted to spend 3,000 years on it. I read seven chapters out of the book of Job this morning. How you doing? This is not going to run my stinking life. I don't want to have a quit me right now. Yeah, that's good. I'm not going to do that. I'm too scared of that. I don't want to participate. <laughs> hey, I got saved in August 25th. 46 years ago yesterday. You know, I heard my testimony last night. And you know, uh, I was, I'm so Catholic, I'm on the airplane flying home from my honeymoon the day before I got saved. Coming back and thanking the Lord for all the cool things he did, a wonderful wedding, wonderful honeymoon. I'm sitting there, I had never read the verse, I had never read the verse, um, the goodness of God leads to repentance. I had never read that before. So I'm thanking God for everything that happened and telling him, I can't wait to get home and fulfill that promise. I made you a, couple, a month or so ago, I'd get saved. And I, I told you I'd come, and I'm getting ready to come. And I thank him. I said, preach, Father. I mean, uh, uh, Lord, it was so cool how even Father Shell had gotten drunk. That's what he said. I remember thanking God for the priest getting drunk. And it's not a kind of line with the accordion. Everybody got into that. Except myself and that. It's like, why is that? Aunt Rose and Aunt Angel, all the Eastern Star League. <laughs> now the priest is not Pol Polak priest Father Shelley keeps bouncing around and, uh, and I'm on his hips and my best man Mike the Knight's on my hips and, and I thank the Lord for that because drinking was just normal in the Catholic Church we had, we had the church in the Catholic Church but what do I tell you that for I went hunting every November up in Pennsylvania normally and so this was no exception. So the first year I'm saved, I went up there. I had a friend of mine named Paul DeArm. He's my, one of my father's friends. I always hung out with older people growing up, you know. And this guy was a truck driver. 
Oh, he's up there in the Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania. And I don't know if you know anything about Pennsylvania, but up there the bars are called beer joints. That's just what they're known as, you know, locally. And we're in this beer joint, and uh, I'm here, and Paul's here, and the guy that owns the, the uh, dairy farm where we're staying, Paul's old friend, Ch Chip, uh, Chip uh, O'Hara, O'Hara, he's over here. And then a couple of his girlfriends over here, maybe somebody else over here. I was shooting pool a few minutes ago, you know, and pictures of beer coming and going, right? And I'm all I'm sitting there witnessing all this. They're looking at me like I'm half crazy. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, "Don't you think you'd get further with these dudes if you weren't sitting there drinking with them and shooting yeah, pool right. with them?" Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. See, that's November. I got saved in all. You know, you're not going to clean up everything right. right? Uh -huh. This thing, you don't even know you got to clean up. That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. right. If you're close to God, guess what? If you want to get right, he'll keep showing you. Yeah. 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 How many of you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, did you sing Draw Me Near? Did we just sing that song? Right. Draw Me Near. Yeah. I'm pressing on the upward way. Don't sing those songs yeah. if you don't want to get closer to God. Let me encourage you. This church is different from last year. Amen. That pastor is so much deeper than he was last year. Amen. And he was shallow last year. Amen. Let's face it. <laughs> I feel the love. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't turn it in close. No, he's grown like he's supposed to. Amen. And so is this church. Amen. I promise you, I would not say that if I didn't mean this. Amen. You should know the kind of person I am. No one know what the Lord's going to do. Yep. Hey, right. so that's the last drink I ever had. Amen. How you doing? Depart from evil. Yeah. We have to spend much time on that. I wonder what it means in the Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's go to the second half of the, uh, the definition. Go to First Corinthians, uh, ch uh, Proverbs chapter nine. Proverbs chapter nine. Here's the second half of the the uh, definition. Proverbs chapter 9, look at verse number 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We saw something very similar to that just a minute ago. Isn't that interesting? Here it goes. Look at the rest of it. And the knowledge of the holy is what? Understanding. Understanding. Now, what did you do? You just saw two Holy Spirit definitions for the word understanding. The first one was to depart from evil. The second one was to gain the, whole, the knowledge of the holy. Boy, you'd almost think those two ideas go together. What does that mean? Hey, you're never going to, of all the things that are holy, you got a holy Bible, you got a holy spirit, and various holy things. What do you think the most holy thing of all is? How about that holy thing Mary had in her womb? Right. That thing. You ever read that, brother? Yeah. Yeah. How about God? He may be the ultimate source of all that is holy. A.W. Tozer wrote a book years ago called The Knowledge of the Holy from that verse. You know what the deal is? Here's evil over here. Sorry. Here's evil over here. And here's you hanging out with the old crowd. And by the way, you got to, in a sense, in some kind of a sense, do that connected with, convert, with, with your conversion. That's what repentance is all about. You don't get saved by not doing bad things. But I got news for you. You couldn't possibly get saved if you didn't dump idolatry. Right. Yeah, you, right. can't, you can't do both at the same time. Right. Right. It said the Thessalonians in the first chapter said, you turn to God from idols. That's right. That's right. You turn to the Lord. You don't turn from the idols and then turn to God. Right. You turn to God and you're turning from the idols. So you can't, and in Colossians it says idolatry, which is covetousness, which is idolatry. For you're saved, you're living for yourself and for the world. Yeah. In order to be saved, you've got to say, I'm sick of myself. I want what you want now, God. And that's why Paul said he preached repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He preached two things. Say, what's repentance? Really simple. I surrender. Yeah. That's all repentance. Yeah. I surrender. I'm sick of my way, Lord. What do you want me to do? Mm. Trust your son? You got it. Amen. Repentance toward God and Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Good. Amen. If that guy, if he would have told that put him in jail, he had to stand on his head and eat a banana. He'd yeah. That's how you know you're ready to be saved. Right. Whatever it would take, you'd be willing to do it. Right. And what you do is you'll put your faith in Christ to save you. 
but you but you but, but you can't you can't well after you're saved especially now the key is you've got to turn from evil that's what that's what holiness is uh, yeah. that's what's wrong with all this stupid modern christianity yeah. this modern strobe Amen. light smoke bomb crazy christianity that ain't no more christianity right. that's Man. my club christianity that's yeah. right yeah, and the longer this thing drags on to the, to the rapture, the nuttier you're, you're going to look at yeah. hold on to them. Amen. And I'm going to take a bunch of baby asses worrying about what people think about me because I want the old time religion. Amen. I want to stay close to God. I don't want to stay away from the world. And I want to, I want to live as close to God and as holy as I can. Amen. And I don't need a nightclub to worship God. Right. That's, right. Right. That's, right. That's, right. That's good. Hey, but here's the whole thing. Why do you turn away from evil? In a sense, to turn to Christ to be saved, but then also as you're growing in the Christian life, you, you what is the understanding to depart from evil? Look, so look, so you can turn to God. What's the second? What's the second definition? To gain the what? The knowledge of the holy. Good. See how much truth you're going to get out of the Bible. Puff it away as you're reading it. <laughs> See how much influence you're going to make with that lost person you're witnessing to when he smells tobacco breath on your, on your tobacco your breath, or, or the liquor, or anything else. Or you, you know, you look like a bum, act like a bum, talk like a bum, smell like a bum. Are you getting home? Not anybody home? All right. Mm -hmm. You get rid of that stuff. You clean up your act. I told you, son of Sam, David Berkowitz, man that shot four, five, six people, depending on what account is considered, considered active, shooting them in the cars. Hello! The women in New York were getting blonde haired wigs in 1977. Because all the women getting shot with brunettes. I sat in that, in that jail cell in, up in, outside of New York City, and Berkowitz told me that man, clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, that many have to get there. He said, That's me now, Brother Grady. Wow. Amen. Clean up! That's what it says. Amen. Clean up! Amen. Even when they went up on the Mount of, hey, prepare to meet that God. Acts Exodus 19 on Mount Sinai. The Lord said, tell them to clean their clothes. You ever saw that verse this afternoon? You think I'm kidding? I saw that this afternoon. I showed it to somebody today. I just saw it. Who did I show that to today? The pastor. You think I'm, you people think I'm crazy. You're looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. And the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today. And tomorrow, let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. Prepare them to get back on. Man, you use that all the time. You're going to go to you know, the great white throne to get ready to get to hell and go to hell. It's time. It's so you can meet God yourself. Right. Amen. All clean up your act. And so you clean up your act, dump your connections with this wrong crowd, wrong practices. I don't mean you ignore all those people. you got to witness them. But you don't become a bum to reach the bums. Amen. Amen. Pull them up. Don't get down on their level. But that's old truth. All Christians have known that. They get to the modern age. Now it's every man for himself. Do what you want to do. Lay out a see it. Every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. Amen. That's okay. Some of us are still dinosaurs. How many dinosaurs are there? Amen. You turn from, uh, from evil so that you can gain the knowledge of the holy. Right. And that's getting close to God and getting to know the Lord. Amen. You can't, He's not going to reveal as much to you if you're sticking in a world where you could do better. Amen. When you don't know any better, He knows that. Amen. I'm thanking the Lord for the priest getting drunk and drinking with all these people. I'm trying to witness it. I didn't see it yet. Right. He knows that. Right. But when He opens your eyes, you better move. Right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay, now watch. Now watch this. Turn. To, you got your Bible open still there to... Uh, Proverbs. Okay, now watch this. Now, now look, we've just passed second base, and we're halfway to third base now, okay? And uh, again, I ate too much pizza now. I'm already feeling it. I'm suffering a bit. So I got to, I, I, listen, depending on what I eat, depends on what I cut out. <laughs> look, I even started eating the pizza. <laughs> okay. I told you this was turning. It was, all, it was very old. Okay, now watch. The key to, the key to, uh, See, I take, it, take the coat off because I, when I put it back on, it gives you help. That's, a, that's a, an evangelist trick. When it picks the coat back up and puts it on, toward the end, it gives you life. And then sometimes they go on for 20 more minutes. Okay, here we go. The key to understanding how God teaches in the Bible, one of the great keys, is that in the Old Testament, God has pictures of the New Testament teachings. Most of you know that. 
like in the book of uh, uh, Genesis, you got Enoch taking a walk, and then one moment he's gone. Preacher, you need a new platform before I come back here next year. The squeaking and scaring me up here. You, you know, Enoch's taking a walk, and then one minute gone. And one minute, bang, he's gone. And you don't know what that means until you get all the way over to the book of Thessalonians, and you see that as a picture of the rapture. The Lord takes takes you know takes you home, takes you up to heaven. Uh, you, and then right after Enoch goes out of here, you got uh, the flood comes up right soon after that, and that's a picture of right after the, the rapture. The Jews are preserved through the flood in that ark, and uh, all this stuff. And uh, for instance, you have a, a, um, you got Abraham who's concerned about having a, 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 a wife for his son Isaac. So he sends his servant, Eleazar, who brings Rebekah home for Isaac. That's a beautiful picture of Abraham representing God the Father. His servant, Eleazar, a picture of the Holy Spirit, who goes out to talk to you and me. Amen. We're Rebekah. We're going to be the church. And he talks to us, and we come back with him to marry Isaac. Jesus Christ, you know, the, the, the son of Abraham. Now look, and by the way, that's one of the greatest little nuggets in that story concerning crazy uh, Calvinism. You know, God banging you on the head, you got to get saved whether or not you want to be saved because he happened to pick you out in eternity past and everybody else he didn't pick just goes to hell whether they want to go or not. That's what Calvinism teaches. Did you notice when he gets to Rebecca, Eleazar says, Wilt thou go with this man? Didn't yeah. he didn't bang her in the head with a club like a caveman? Drag her back, irresistible grace, E U L I P Tulip I, irresistible grace. Come on, will thou go? God's not hard up. He doesn't shake hands like a missionary. That's right. He doesn't have to force himself on anybody. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. You read that verse? God gives men the freedom to resist Him. Silly teaching. So that's a picture. So here's the deal. The old, the old cliche in Bible school is the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The New Testament will show you what all these types and pictures and shadows were all about. And all these wonderful New Testament doctrines are hiding in the Old Testament. You all got that? Yeah. And one of the things, so God uses pictures, right, and illustrations. Like you read the life of Joseph. Uh, there's, uh, you know, ten chapters in the Bible dedicated to that man. When you read that, you'll find about 160 things that Joseph did, that Jesus will do. Amen. He's the greatest type picture of the Lord. So you, most of you know that, right? But like, where's Jason at? There's my, look at my man back there sitting in the throne. He just got, he just got, just got saved. Amen. He just got. He don't know what this sweet lady that was here last night. She said, "I read Given by Inspiration. That was a hard book. That's the easiest book I wrote, as far as what people think." She said, I, "I'll read the West Cotton Oil. I don't know what that means. I, I see Ruckman. Ruckman. I, what does that mean?" She said, "You know, she's fun. You know, when you're young, you the Lord, you don't know everything yet, but you'll get there in time." But uh, but these pictures, okay? Things are in pictures. So watch this. So God's got a picture of where he wants you to be in order to get to know him. What's the deal of the Christian life? Look where we're going. He wants you to dump the old crowd, turn your back on the world, and come to him after you're saved. Understanding is to depart from evil and to gain the knowledge of the whole. Amen. Is that hard to understand so far? Okay, so here we go. How do, you, how, how do you get the knowledge of the Holy? Well, you kind of hang out with God right. in His crib. Want to see it? Want to see it? Stay with me now. Look at Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24. Boy, this is good, neighbor. Verse 3. Proverbs 24, verse 3. Through wisdom is in house building. See it? And by, what's the next word? Understanding. understanding it is what? Established. established. You can build something without establishing it. Anybody ever see a shoddy house? It goes up and it may not stay up very long, right? So wisdom, you, you build a house with wisdom, but you solidify that thing and you establish that thing with understanding. 
God used the house here as a picture of where he wants you to be with wisdom and understanding are going to be connected to this spiritual house that God's talking about in the Old Testament. No matter how cloudy or you know, strange this starts sounding, don't worry about it. Just stay with me piece by piece. Now turn to Proverbs chapter number 9. You'll get it in just a few minutes. Proverbs 9. Here you go. What did you just read there a minute ago there in uh, Proverbs 24? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, through wisdom is in house building. Look at Proverbs 20, Proverbs 9, 1. Wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. Hath what? Build with what? Right. Her house. She hath hewn out her what? Seven, seven pillars. That's a, the, the title of the sermon is The Seven Pillars in the House of Wisdom. That's what I've called the sermon for 30 something years. So there's a house here, a spiritual house. Just imagine it in your mind. It's, a, it's meant to give you pictures. It's what the Old Testament deals with. And this, this house has got seven pillars. I usually use a microphone stand. Well, these things are perfect looking for pillars, but this, this thing is taller. And I don't want you to, I want you to be able to see if you can. And I usually use a mic stand. These old houses in Bible days had, had seven pillars. They had an open front, open front, and it had seven pillars like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. With the front kind of open. Flat roof. Just like uh, London. Uh, you know, people in London are white, very pale skin because they build up. Small country, small island. They can't expand out, so they build up. And, and new construction people, they, they keep putting new levels on the house and they'd always hang over, flip, flip, flip it out. So pretty soon, the sunlight was gone. That's exactly that why people want to like that. And those alleys with narrow streets, no light coming out. And uh, in Israel, they would they would build up. Well, they do at least they do their they, they didn't have out backyards as much as they hang out up on the rooftop, flat roof, and they do the socializing up there. Okay, now <clears throat> seven pillars. Look at look what it says about this house. Verse uh, <coughs> uh, two uh, two. She have hewn, this wisdom is the subject. We're talking about her house. This is a picture of where God wants you to live in your spiritual life. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple. It doesn't mean stupid. It means, uh, somebody explained it one time, you know, the uh, you got to put, you have to, but the word not pleats. Pleats. You put pleats in the pants or a skirt. Those pleats, once they're in there, they're they're uh, they're pretty much permanent once they've been pressed or put in. A simple person is like a person with no pleats in there yet. The pleats are your are your habits in life, and the character gets put in there. You can't teach an old dog new tricks when you're young, like those two little sweet girls running around all week. Uh, they're innocent. And, uh, you know, uh, when you're older and get saved, sometimes it's tougher, all that stuff in your life. Number nine. <laughs> you know, a lot of stuff in your head. Now watch. She hath killed, uh, uh, whoso is simple. You know, who's a, who's a non-encumbered yet, non-pleaded? You know, you're, you're just starting out in life. Uh, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Verse 4, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. Look at the last part of verse 4. As for him that wanteth understanding, hello, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Hey, <laughs> what's the definition for understanding? Look at verse 6. Forsake the foolish, and live, and go in the way of... There you go. Depart from evil is understanding. You ever read that verse tonight again? He that, okay, he that reproveth the scorner get it to himself shame. Watch out for people in the church that got all the answers and you can't lead them down the street. That's what a scorner is in the Bible. A, shep, a sheep and, uh, I mean, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Good sheep, good Christian people are meant to be led by their shepherd, by their pastor. A troublemaker in a church who know, has his own agenda, that's a wolf in sheep's clothing because you can't lead a wolf. Uh, he that reproveth the scorner get it to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man, get at himself a block. Reprove not a scorner, 
lest he hate thee. What are you supposed to do with a scorner if you can't reprove him? Scripture gives you two definite, two, uh, Proverbs gives you two uh, commands. Smite the scorner, and the simple shall beware. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall cease. I'm just trying to help you here. Not have trouble. I want you to be here next year. So I can come back and have another good time. Yeah. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he'll love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You know where you get the knowledge of the holy? You get it in this house. You get it with God. The key to the whole sermon are those seven pillars of understanding, because that's how the house is established, by these pillars. Stay with me. This is meant to, you got to go. When we hit third base, you know, all the lights will come on. And from third base to home plate, you're going to be screaming. Okay. Now, watch this. Turn to Proverbs 10. Whoa, we're right here. We're right here already. This is so good, I can't stand it. Uh, Proverbs 10. Okay. Now, watch. <clears throat> so, what do you think is the thing you got to get? We looked at this already. What do you get first? Do you get wisdom or do you get understanding? Wisdom. <laughs> you got to get understanding in order to get wisdom. Remember the dominoes? You need wisdom to practice charity. How do you get wisdom? The key to getting wisdom is to get understanding. That's the key to get this, to get understanding. What is understanding? Turning away from evil and getting the knowledge of the Holy. Anybody figure that out yet? You dump the world. And you get close to God, you're going to have wisdom. Ho, ho, how hard is that to follow? You understand that so far? So I want you to see how cool the, the scriptures laid this out. So you got to get understanding before you get wisdom. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now look at these beautiful parallel scriptures that show you that. Look at Proverbs, and we're, look, we're talking about a house now. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 13. In the lips of him that hath, understanding what's the next thing say wisdom. wisdom is found do you see the order mm -hmm. you, you'll find wisdom with his understanding you all see that mm -hmm. look at the next verse verse 23 it is as sport to a fool to do mischief but a man of what mm -hmm. understanding what yeah, has wisdom didn't say a man of wisdom has understanding did it a man of understanding don't you see it don't you want to get understanding tonight because if you get that, you're going to get wisdom. And if you get wisdom, you're going to do everything right. The ultimate crowning achievement being charity, which we haven't even defined yet. Again, we're about two feet from third base, so stay with me. Look at, look at the next chapter, uh, or, chap or chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 33. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that what? Hath understanding. You all see that? See how that is, is so consistent, right? Yeah. Now, Pastor, can I help? Can you help me for a minute? Sure. Uh, come on up here for just a minute. This is as good. This is this is beautiful. I love this message because it's a visual. It's a visual message, and I've been told by a zillion people it, to help them because they could see it all come together. In just a minute. I'm going to bring it all together. Come, he, I'm going to let him be God. Come on up here. All right. Now I'm I'm you. I'm the dumb Christian. <laughs> Stand over there, God. Look at that way. Okay. This is his house. Yes? The house of wisdom. And that's where God wants you to He don't want you to hang out in the streets with the dipstick Christians. Some of the dumb Christians are worse than the lost people for messing around. That's right. Separate from the world. Uh, from, from evil, right? So look. Here you are partying, you know, drinking in it, shooting bullets in, in the beer joint, you know, telling them about Jesus. Get a life, you know. Okay, forget about it. Look. You, turn, you don't turn your back on the sinner. You turn your back on the lifestyle. Amen. Look. Now look. Why? Because that's the goal of that. Mm. The goal is to get in there with him. Mm. Jason, this is a perfect sermon for you as a new Christian. Okay? So look. Um, you come on up here into God's house. And the deal. You see where my back is? My back is to you now. And I'm facing God. The knowledge of the holy. That's what understanding is. Two parts. Turn from evil, get this. Yeah. Can't get this hanging on to that. No. Yeah. That's 
Say that's it's good. very basic. That's good. Yeah, that's good. All right, now watch. So I'm in God's house, and I'm hanging in here with the Lord, and watch this. When I spend enough time with Him, let me show you what He's going to do. Here's what He's going to do. You got your Bible there? Look at Proverbs 17. Look at verse 24. Wisdom is before who? Him that what? Hello. It's before him that hath understanding. Watch. So I'm with the Lord here, spending all this time with the Lord. And about the time he knows I'm ready to go, you know, this is a repeated operation. It's not a one-time thing. But when I get a, when I get full of God, when I gain the knowledge of the I know God somewhat. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Where do you get the mind of God? You get it right in that book. If you spend time in that book, you, uh, Job says, acquaint thyself with him and be at peace. These Christians that are running around as scared of everything like the unsaved people are, that's, that's a sign that they don't have any time with God. Yeah. You can't spend a lot of time with God and be shook up about anything. Right. Hey, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose yeah. mind is stayed on thee, stayed on Jehovah. Keep your mind on God. Watch. And this is what the Lord's going to do next. Okay, now we haven't rehearsed here, so wait a minute. Stop listening. <laughs> okay, so after, okay. after you spend time with God, this is what God's going to do. Don't forget this is His house, His crib. Come with me, son. Let's take out this bay window. All the things I can show you. You know what's out there? The world. See this? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Wisdom is seeing the world. From God's perspective. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, that is good. That's all it is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, that guy got that first anointing on his eyes. Remember that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Baby Christian now. He sees men. Mm -hmm. Like trees walk. Amen. You know what you do with trees? You use them. You had, all you ever did was see Wizard of Oz. You know, they take apples off apple tree. You climb up a tree. You sit under the tree for shame. You cut the tree down. He, he must have cut down a million trees for the firewood in his yard. Man, these tree huggers around here, as far as they have to surround his house. <laughs> you use trees for firewood. You know what you do when you're first saved? Unless you're a super spiritual giant, if you're just a baby Christian, you might tend to do what you were doing before you were saved. Use people for yourself. Boy, it's quiet. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. when he put that second anointing on his eyes, <clears throat> It said he could see men clearly yeah. for what they are. Amen. Never dying soul. All these crazy people going down the road with a mask on their face inside a car with the windows yeah. out. <laughs> they're, they're ready to drive right into heaven. Yeah. Sad thing. Yeah. And that's what makes you go after people your whole life. When you see them from God's perspective. Uh, it is. Well, it is. You all see that? That's what wisdom is. It is. But how do you get here? Look, how do you get here? Right? To the end of the trail. It's very simple. You need understanding to do that. And where is understanding? How many pillars holding this house up? Seven. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You know what that means, neighbor? That means somewhere out yonder there in that New Testament, there must be a list of seven things. All seven of which have something to do with gaining a better knowledge of God. The knowledge of what was that right? No. Now we could just spend another three hours just surveying. What about this one? Now that, uh, I, I say we so God, I've been preaching this for 30 years. I found my list. You can get your list. I got my list. Yeah. Want to see something beautiful? Or not? Now we're taking third days. Yeah. The rest of the message will be over no time and you'll be screwed. Yeah. Back to the home. <laughs> Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. La la la. La la la. Put your seatbelt on, neighbor. Here it comes. 
let's let's check out our um, let's check out our context. Let's see if we're close to where we might want to be. Second Peter chapter one. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Wouldn't you like to have that in your life? How do you get it? The knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Sounds like the knowledge of the Holy there, doesn't it? The more you know about God, the more everything falls into place. Anybody home? That's understanding, isn't it? The knowledge of the Holy. Okay. Let's go to the last verse of the book. Let's go to the last verse. See, see how this book is holding up context-wise. Last verse. Verse 18, chapter 3. But grow in grace. Did we start out talking about grace in the first verse? For last verse. But grow in grace and in the no. knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Give me glory both now and forever. Amen. Okay. Sounds like we're in the right book. Talking about the knowledge of God, doesn't it? Okay, neighbor. Now, we all proceed right now. If you promise, he, he, he showed us how to shoot the shotgun, the, uh, to dig it into the shoulder, and, with, and hit the hip high, and dig it into your, your gut. Is that 12 gauge or 18 inch? No, yours was 14 inch barrel. No, 18. It was 14. No, it was 18. No, I'm just kidding. Here comes yeah, yeah. Here comes the hell out. Yeah. It's a joke out there, you stinking filthy animal. Yeah. Yeah. Here comes the The pastor yeah. didn't have a 14 inch. Yeah. It was an 18 inch. How's that? Pastor Jones. Joe Jones. He was showing us, so dig that shotgun in like that, see? Okay. Now, dig yourself in real tight. Hold that chair. So you don't fall out. And you see what's coming right now. Okay? You get hurt, it's your own, you're on your own. Heard you? yeah. about that Jewish doctor, Lebinowitz, gave his patient six months to live. The guy didn't pay his bill, he gave him another six months. <laughs> right, you, you'll be going to the doctor pretty soon if you don't if you fall out of your chair. Alright, here we go. Watch verse three now. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Wouldn't you like to have all things that you need? How do you get all things? I don't know. What's the rest of it say? Through the what? The knowledge of Him. Hello, neighbor. The knowledge of the Holy. The knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So because of all that, verse 6, whereby, right, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. We're saved. We have the spiritual nature. We're in Christ. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, neighbor. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your what? Amen. You know this building you got to build here? This house? It's got to have a foundation, doesn't it? What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians? Other foundation can no man lay, but that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Amen. Are you saved tonight? But then you're on the rock. Amen. But if you don't throw a roof up, you're going to be soaking wet. When that storm comes, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, but I don't do anything else I'm supposed to do. <clears throat> hey, that man that came out of the pew last 46 years ago, this this yesterday morning when I got saved, I walked the aisle, told you the story yesterday. What are you coming here for, sir? I want to be saved, I said. And the preacher went like that, called a man out of the pew, 600 people there, took me in the side room, led me to the Lord, and that guy blew his brains out a few years later. Left a widow and four or five children. The old black preacher put it this way. You may be saved down here, but you ain't necessarily safe down here. Uh, yeah. You might want to have a roof over your head so you don't get soaking wet. You're on the rock, but you might be a drenched rat. How many of you know anybody that's really been saved and their life's a wreck? Yeah. The rock's not enough. The rock gets you into heaven. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. I want you to have eternal life and the abundant life while you're waiting for the eternal life. Amen. So here we go. We've got a foundation down there of the rock. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Can somebody help me here? All you got to do is count. Add to your faith what? Virtue. virtue. And to virtue. Wow. Knowledge. And to knowledge. Amen. Patience. And to patience. Temperance. And to temperance. Amen. Godliness. And the godliness, brotherly kindness, yeah, and the brotherly kindness, what? Charity. What's that 
Seven. Number of perfection. The bottom of perfect is what's that last one? Ooh, wonder what that doing. See, that's a quinky dinky. Yeah, but it's cool, isn't it? Looks like the seven pillars of understanding. Wisdom hath built it her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Wis through wisdom a house is built that is established by understanding. You ever see a house with, a, with all the front all the beams aren't right? What's going to happen to that crazy roof? I think it's going to be a disaster. You got seven perfect pillars holding up this roof, establishing this house. This is where God wants you to live. And every single one of those pillars has something to do with knowledge, the understanding, the knowledge of God. And here they are. Now we're halfway to home plate from third base. Most of the sermon is preparation. The rest of this is just... <laughs> 90% of this message is preparation. The other 10% is conviction. Right. And here's where your point is. We've had some good services here. Yeah. Okay, we have, right? Mm -hmm. Any yeah. yeah. greedy people in here? You got, did you get everything you want? Mm -hmm. Are you all done? Mm -hmm. Do you want anything else tonight? Mm -hmm. Maybe God's got something for you before you go home. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Amen. Okay. Well, let them know you, let them know you wanted to talk. I preached a sermon one time. You know what I preached on? I preached on Abraham went out to a place that he knew not of. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. You know what I said? I said, I preached this up in Idaho. I never preached it the same time. I said, how, I, I hadn't bowed their heads. I said, how many of you would be willing to promise God that you'll give God whatever he convicts you about tonight before I tell you what I'm preaching on? I might be preaching on restitution. I might be preaching on extended fasting. I might be preaching on, you know, give you a whole, a lot of churches have a give it all Sunday. You give your entire paycheck on one Sunday to a little building program or something. You don't know what I'm going to preach on. Before I tell you what I'm going to preach on, would you be willing to promise God that if he convicts you, that you'll give him what he's convicting you about? And I'd say, now you have to raise your hand. Now you have to your head. That's what he told Abraham. Abraham, go, on, go that way, Abraham. He sent him out of the place. He knew that we all think we're so spiritual, right? Yeah. Yeah. God help us. All I want to ask you to do is, all I'm asking you to do now, I'm done. Can you take some inventory on your own house? Mm -hmm. What's your house like? Amen. I'm going to show you exactly how God wants you to have it. And if you're doing fine, okay. But you've got a few pillars out. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't leave town until I got it correct with the Lord. Amen. Maybe that's just that you want to live there. Sure. You want to live like a big bat with the world. Where the world's coming from? <laughs> How about it? I know better. Hmm. Paul said, I caught you with God. Paul was beating him up all the time in a good way. Trying to get through them. Right. 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 Yeah. Right, here we go. Add to your faith, what's the first pillar? Virtue. virtue. You know what virtue is? Virtue is the preparation for the truth. That's the first pillar into the house. You can't even get in there without virtue. Who can find a virtuous woman? Her, her price is far above ruby. The best definition that's ever been come up with for virtue is moral, moral excellence. That's your spiritual backbone. Virtue is what you are, uh, what kind of a person you are. Bob Jones Sr. says, when, when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is nigh well useless. If you have virtue, you realize you, you are zero with the ring rubbed out without God. Without me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5. I mean, virtue is, hey, virtue is, without God, I'm toast. Hey, here's virtue. You sitting in church tonight like this. He that, I'll pour water and he that is thirsty. People with virtue will come to every single service unless they're hindered. And they can't come because of work or something like that. The, the doors are open. They're there. They don't slum it. You know, it just comes Sunday morning, baby. You can't get enough. Of the, of the preaching of the word of God because you're hungry for God Amen. and you know without God you're nothing and you're so grateful to God for what he's done for you can, can, I don't want to be your personal here uh, uh, God, Rod yeah. God, God said he comes to his house so often and just pinched himself he's so happy and God provided a nice place for the live in a place in the country where he thought God was sending him I drive that $36,000 Honda Pilot all around the country. Got over 2,400 miles in December. I've got 43, 44,000 out of the ready. Why? God sent $35,000 in the mail for me. 
Amen. There were six churches, so I could get a replacement for that uh, car. Hit that, that van, hit the deal, wipe my de a vehicle out with 240,000 miles. I'm been driving down the highway many nights. I just rub the dashboard. I've heard enough about circuit riding preachers sleeping on the ground next to their horses, and I'm a circuit riding preacher in the 21st century. Amen. This is my horse, and I I just rub that yeah. dashboard plenty of times a night to all. Pants, pants, pants. What a preacher, spiritual. Hello, Baptist Church. This is a Baptist Church. Don't urge your lady here. You better do something. He does it. Preacher, I'm sure you do. You've got enough. you got a wife and parents. I mean, they're, they're helping you with this church. you got a grandma who's got more power in God than the other one. Okay, how, how, how you doing? How you doing? All right. how's, your, how's your first building? You don't even get into the building. Has anybody ever seen Wizard of Oz? She knocks on the door, and the dude comes out there, hello, and who are you? You know, the keeper of the, the door there. And they're all sitting there. You can't get in here unless you come through this first door. This is what you are. How you doing? Well, they lost 90% of the group. <laughs> Why don't we pray and go home? <laughs> what are you going to do with the rest of these pillars? Right. Amen. Add to your faith virtue. Virtue, watch, first pillar. This is the preparation for the truth. You got this one down. This gets you started, okay? You're not going to learn diddly if your heart's not right. I will pour water on he that is thirsty. Floods upon the dry grounds. If you sit in church like this, you know what I mean? Bath the saloon I told you about. Forget about it. Ready? And by the way, you know what I thought of yesterday? I got saved 46 years ago yesterday. The Sunday morning sermon was on Acts chapter 10, where Cornelius got saved. And he was a member of the Italian band. <laughs> you don't even know why Italians can't count to 10. Because every time they get to two, they run into a tree. Same thing. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Ready? Add to your faith virtue. And the virtue what? Knowledge. Knowledge. That's the second pillar. Now the second pillar is the reception of the truth. This one is the preparation for it. Lord, I'm ready. Speak to my heart. I'm hungry. I want to know what to do. All right. God says, okay, that's the truth. Then if you want to know what the truth is, then you get on your little bicycle and get busy. What is, what is preparation of the truth? Uh, what is it? Knowledge? That's you taking advantage of learning everything you can possibly learn about God. The most important thing being the local church. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? Hey, you get into church, you get in their Sunday school, <coughs> Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, special meetings, hello, you show up every single, David said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Not a New Testament church. Just a spiritual principle. Hello, neighbor. You take advantage of all the opportunities you can. You got a widow lady here last night who's been only saved about 10 months who drives four hours by herself and gets a whole, gets, gets a place to stay and comes in here two nights. I uh, would have been here tonight, but she's got to go back to Maine to be in her own church. Amen. She don't know any better. She's just a baby Christian. Yeah. Sitting there taking, scribbling notes and everything. Amen. Came over and asked me to sign my, give her my inspiration book that she bought. I couldn't give her a free book as a widow. She got all five books to her. She comes over and had me sign her, give her my inspiration book. 2,000 notes in it. Right. Right. Amen. A little widow. She, and that's another thing. You need to buy good spiritual books. No. I'm sorry. It's a conflict of interest. The Lord knows. Hey, reading your Bible. Reading, that's very important, if not the most important thing. most important thing you can read is the Word of God. Yes. Hearing the preaching of the Word of God. Listening to spiritual, um, uh, good night, a, a radio program, I'll listen to spiritual music and sermons over the, uh, the internet. And uh, hey, listen to this one. Counseling. Counseling. You ladies in the church, you need to be coming to the preacher's wife, and then you need to be going to the preacher's mother. Uh, uh, the elder ladies in the church are small. I didn't say older, I said elder. <laughs> Titus chapter 2, you younger men, Jason, you need to be hanging out with these older men and, and getting, getting direction from them. Read Titus 2. The pastor is supposed to give you guys advice. He doesn't want you to run, run your life, but he wants veto power. Yeah. You're getting ready to do something dumb. 
and he tells you I got a bad feeling, don't do it, you better not do it. That's right. He doesn't want to tell you what to do, but some of us are out there a while and we got a little discernment. Go get my red book right there and go to the second to the last page of the book and see if it doesn't say from Osama to Obama, the Lord's got everything under control. Yeah. And see if the copyright date is in 2008, uh, five, three years before Obama became president. Amen. What does that mean? Some of us preachers aren't as dumb as we look. Say amen. Right here. <laughs> you need advice, counsel? You need to take, walk all pillar to me, take in every single thing you can take in to learn about God. There's a bunch of stuff. And don't do pick and choose what you want. Do it all if you want to be closer to God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's good. How you doing, neighbor? Yeah. All right. Okay, number two is uh, knowledge. Add to your faith, foundation, virtue, preparation for the truth. Now, pillar two, the knowledge of the truth. That's uh, the knowledge. That's the, the, the reception of the truth. Taken in the truth, okay? Then add to knowledge. Third one is what? Yeah. Temperance. All right, this is really good. You all ever hear of temperance steel? Mm -hmm. The Ladies Temperance Society fighting booze? Temperance is the effect of the truth. Yeah, that's good. You get burdened to get it here and convince God you're serious. So number two, boom, he, you show up and start putting feet to your prayers. Somebody said your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Do something about the fact that you want to learn something. And then God will dump all that truth on you. Then once you get it, you keep on going this way and don't let that glare bother you. It's there to keep your attention. You keep moving forward and you're chewing on it now. You're thinking on it. And by the time you get to pillar three, it's going to have some effect on you. Amen. For instance, in pillar two, you hear a sermon. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Cool, you know, all right. And you're thinking about it. And by the time you get to pillar three, you think, you know, I don't need three boats. Amen. Amen. We do have a missions conference. I could probably sell one of those stinking three boats. Give the money to missions. Yeah. Amen. That's all. Hey, here you are. You're at pillar two. You fathers here a sermon. Sunday morning. The glory of children are their fathers. Hmm. You get to thinking about that? And by the time you get to pillar three, you're thinking, yeah, you know, when I was a little kid, none of us kids ever said to each other, my mother can wash dishes better than your mother. Because my dad can lick your dad. And you realize what a window you have with children as the father. You have ten times more influence over them than a mother does. And you know what you do? You start spending a little quality time with your children yourself. And your wives, see to it that you reverence your husband. Boy, you get to thinking, I, not only am I supposed to obey my husband, I'm supposed to reverence him too? Amen. Not that time you give up beating your husband up with a frying pan. <laughs> you say, I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. How you doing? Right. You want to get through this house? you got to be hungry for the truth. you got to go after the truth. And then you got to obey the truth God shows you. Right. Amen. There'll be some changes in your life as you move it along. Okay. Now listen, people go back, Christian people, every one of you people make this journey, and you make it repeatedly through your Christian life. But Christians will go back on God in two spots. Okay? Here, they, here comes the first spot. You know how horses are? With the, with the things on their head? I don't know. The same. The first horse ever rode was in front of a 10 cent store. <laughs> Boy, my father sure went to Aqueduct a lot of time. Hey, youngers, here they come. There they go. You don't know what that stuff is. <laughs> All right, watch. We're coming in with the blinders on, right? Look. One, two, three. See? Now it's time to pivot. Time to pivot. Add to your temperance. What? Patience. Oh! <laughs> Pray for patience. You look at that middle pillar, it's the middle pillar of the building. And from here, all you can see is a gigantic flame. Like the flame that led the Jews through the wilderness at nighttime. Pillar of cloud the day. See that big flame there? That's the next place you're supposed to go. I don't want to go there. Forget about it. And this is where the Christians go away. 
from God. And you know where they go back to? Right here. Unless you're a day back, free will Baptist, you've got eternal security. You're still saved. But you're fixing to go home soaking wet. You got, you're still on the rock, but you're not going to have any roof over your head. You're going to wind up like that guy that led me to the Lord. Fill himself with a shot. On the roof of a building. You want to go in? The preacher, that looks scary in there. Can I give you two reasons why you should go in the pillar form? That's the trials of your faith. Man. God's going to take you in there. Well, you know, he won't drag you in there. Mm -hmm. Say, give me two reasons why I should go in there. I'll give you two. Anybody remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, they're standing there with the king. All right? They throw three people in. Yes or no? Yes. And they, they, they look in there, and how many people do they see? Four. And out comes Shadrach, Meshach, how many of those do they They throw three in. How many are in there? Four. All right, how many come out? Three. Thank you very much, Elvis has left the building. Wow. Yeah. You know what that means? Guess where Jesus lives? Yeah. He's right in there. Don't you want to get close to Jesus? Amen. God help us, yes. You said you give us two two reasons to get in there. It's a high pillar there, ten feet high. You can't see over it, so you got to look through it with the eyes of faith. Tell me what's on the other side of that pillar. What's the next pillar? Thank you very much. Who wants to be godly coming? Godly is on this side of the fire. You can't get godly unless you go through that. So go home, go back to your pool, pool cable and your Budweiser. I'm saying, burn off it, see? <laughs> Old black people said, if God expected you to smoke, you put your nose on your head for a chimney. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. Anybody want to go? That's good. Anybody left? Yeah. We got five people still with me. Yeah. Here we go. And to your temperance, Oh, preacher, this is so hot in here. This when you get laid off, talk to a man on the telephone on the way to church again tonight with Brother Todd. Preacher down at Gaffney, South Carolina, has got, I think, three children. Two of his three children are afflicted. Look, lifetime carried them, can't walk. The one son just died, I don't know, three months ago. Late 20s, I'm afraid I can't remember the exact details. Maybe almost close to 30 years of old. I don't know. Look, the, both the husband and wife's backs have gone out over the years carrying them. Sweet thing. He misses them. Tonight, his afflicted daughter helicoptered to Grady Hospital in Atlanta, put on a ventilator. 30 different seizures in 20 minutes. We don't know how she's going to make it tonight. Some, gods, some of God's people go through it, don't they? That man and his wife went to Africa, Cameroon, Africa, what, last year? Eight children? Yeah. They're in the country, what, three weeks, and some Bazubi nut job shoots the husband, kills him with a bullet in the head? Did you bump your toe today? It's been a rough week on you. Mm. God's people go through it sometimes. Mm. So here you are, look. You're in here. Oh, it's so hot in here. It's so terrible. Don't jump out. God's people either won't go in or they get in there and as soon as it starts to get hot, they go out. They don't go on. They don't hang in there and wait for God. You know what pillar four is? Pillar four is the refining of the truth. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. God just wants to refine you in here. Now watch this. This is so cool. This is the refining of the truth. See, you take the truth in, pillar two, and you make some outward changes because of it, but you never really learn what it is until you get into here. That's where it's taught to you. For instance, you're over here. Uh, my God shall supply all your needs. You're here on Sunday morning, you hear a preacher preach that verse, and you say, that's nice, and you're making $50 an hour, and 
all the overtime you want. You got more financial security than you could ask for. So you say, that's a nice sermon, you know. It doesn't register anywhere because you really don't need it. So God says, let me help you know what that means. <laughs> and when you get it over here, here's where you get laid off, COVID-19. Holy mackerel, how am I going to survive? Blah, blah, blah. You're in here panic-stricken. Look, about uh, four or five weeks later, you know, you get back on the job, and guess what? You, bat, you, pop, you pop out over here, and you've gained 20 pounds. How in the world did that happen? You learned it in here. That's how this works. I don't know everything, but I've been saying 46 years. I know how it works. Here you go. Pillar two, my grace is sufficient for thee. Oh, that's nice when everything's going okay. It's a good, neat verse. Over here's where your baby dies. Here's where your afflicted son dies and this and that. And all of a sudden you feel that unseen hand. How many have ever noticed in a funeral, mostly everybody's crying except the immediate family? They're a rock of Gibraltar a lot of times. I mean, if it's a good spiritual family, they'll cry. They'll do their crying. But when they're at the funeral, God takes his grace away from you many times. So you'll be weak enough to be crying in front of them. And that gives them that great strength when they see your love. That's what Jesus was doing, weeping at Lazarus' tomb. Strength in Mary and Martha. It's a cool place to be right here. And so, when you pop out of Pillar four, you come out here on this side, and that's now, guess what? Now it's godliness. Now you comprehend the truth. This is the comprehension of the truth. You just took it in over here, but you really didn't understand it until it got refined in here. When God's all done with you, you pop out over here. Guess what? To some measure of your Christian life, you now possess godliness. You are like God. You've experienced this truth. You know that thing from experience. He's been merciful to you, and now you got it. So guess what? Two times you pivot. You pivot over there. It's time to change directions again. You've been coming in this way, right? So guess what? Now that you've got some godliness, look. It's time to pivot, and it's time to get to work. Yeah. Last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Old school dinosaurs like us still want to hang in there with that Philadelphia church age mindset. Brotherly love, we want to serve. And so the next step, add to your godliness what? We're going to start with the, with the saved people, not the lost people. A lot of Christians don't understand that idea. As we have therefore opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, especially the of the household of faith. You got 200 people, a lost person and an unsaved person. Two people, you got one banana. And I've been wanting those bananas all week, but they're green. Carol, just so you know. Everything else is perfect, but those bananas look a little green, amen. But I keep thinking about them. But I've got everything. Oatmeal muffins with chocolate chips on top of them. I'm telling you, neighbor, it's, it's a wild week. I'm never going back to Motel 6 again. <laughs> hey, you got one banana. You give it to the saved person, not the lost person. Amen. Brotherly kindness. And you know what this means? This means whatever God has put you through in that fire, and you're over here now, you understand it? You know what you're supposed to do here? Look. You look at the Christians coming through behind you. And look at the ones ready to go into that fire that have been where you are. I just found out that you're a widow, I think, from that testimony. Is that right, preacher? Yeah, that lady got a book last year. Are you still praying for me? Because you got to send the book back if you don't pray for me. I told you that last year. But you know what? Sooner or later, one of these ladies here may find out her husband's terminally ill. Possibly. You know? That woman's going to be very concerned. She doesn't know what God can do for a woman who loses a husband. You do. You're supposed to nail that lady. Minister to her. Amen. Any of us that have done it, have any suffering here, we're supposed to minister to the brethren. Mm. But you got the experience to do it. Mm. That is pillar number six. That is the dissemination of the truth. You're going to disseminate the truth, get it out. 
apply it where you can. Minister to the brethren. Brotherly kindness. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's what's wrong with stupid uh, internet church. Not forsaking the assembling. Give me, give me a verse for church. Give me a verse for church. Not assembling the assembly. Not, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves yeah. together as the matter of some is. Some dingbats won't do it. But exhorting one another. I told these crazy preachers and Christians the other day, want to stay home from church beyond the internet? How do you exhort one another through an internet service? Yeah. You send an email to some guy when you're listening to the sermon? You exhort each other. Boy, I've been to Russia before. You don't want to go to those churches. They kiss each other on the mouth. I mean, if a like Christian man kisses a Christian woman, if that's what they believe, maybe I can get myself doing it. But I'm going to kiss another man on the mouth. <laughs> and they do that drinking unfermented wine. I mean, fermented wine. Some of those churches, are, not all. Not the good ones I identify with. I've been to some of the crazy ones. Okay, neighbor? Are you ready? Okay, you ready now? We're at the end. And add to your brotherly kindness. What? Sure. There's the last one. You see where you are now? You're ready to launch out into the world. To the lost people, really. Mm -hmm. In principle, you deal with the brethren first. And then you deal with the lost people. Mm -hmm. Watch. But here's the deal. You cannot go to pillar seven from pillar six without something happening. And this is the second place where God's children will go back and never make it to the end. They go back at pillar three, looking into the fire, or jump out of pillar four because of the fire. That's the one place they bomb out. And if they don't bomb out there, they're going to bomb out right here and never make it to seven. Seven is the bomb of perfectness. You get there, you made it. This is the last step. Now, let me show you what happens. Pastor, could I use you again? Here's the preacher. What is, pa what, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, Pillar 7? is charity. Okay, come on up here, preacher. So, so here, here's how it works in most churches, okay? Uh, have you ever helped anybody? How many have ever helped a Christian? And you paid the price for doing it. Okay. All right, so look. So I'm uh, I'm Joe I'm Joe church member I'm jo and I'm Joe Deadbeat church member okay and here's the pastor and I'm going to get up to the pastor the pastor uh, I need you to pray about something <laughs> you know I thank God I was an ex Catholic grew up in New York City with a dad for uh, that was a bookie uh, it's hard for a saint some deadbeat Christian to throw something past me it just comes easy to see right through him he says but the, uh, pastor could you pray for me I need eighty nine dollars and five cents. Get my uh, utility bill paid so they don't turn off the heat and our kids get you know frozen to death. It is January right now, preacher. You know? uh -huh. Could you pray that I get eighty nine dollars and five cents? Would you pray for that? You know, uh -huh. he knows what he's doing, uh -huh. and this guy knows what I'm doing. Uh -huh. But see, these kids are involved, yeah. and so the preacher is going to say, "Well, instead of praying, let, let me uh, you know." And then he pulls. He's got you know five twenties, and the guy says, "Okay, I'll I'll uh, get back to you, preacher." <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, preacher. Yeah. I'm going to go out and buy a bottle of wine or something. Right? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. Right? Now watch. Thank you, preacher. And get behind the pole. Now, here's what happens next time. Now, the preacher's up there preaching. Joe Deadby, of course, I'm not here. I'll be in the back of the corner. But I'm going to sit here so you can see. So I'm sitting in church next Sunday, and the preacher's preaching. I don't care what he's preaching about. I'm under conviction. And no matter what he's up there saying, I think he's talking about me because exactly. I have a guilty conscience. And I'm saying to myself, who does that bum think he is? He gives me a lousy hundred dollars and he thinks he can preach about me. Oh, right? This is how it plays out all over the country. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, when a preacher's not looking, get a pillow sick of it. You'll think that way. There's, and this is, remember, this is a Baptist church, so we're all the same. This is what's happened to all of you as you minister to the brain. It always happens. Who does he think he is? Thank you. Anybody ever get stabbed in the back? By the brother? It I, think, I think Jesus had a guy named Judas. Put it to him. Now what are you going to do? I tried to help God's people. I tried to be a good Christian. And this is how I get you. Sometimes the pastor hurts you. 
Sometimes he doesn't understand something. Hello, neighbor. You want a perfect preacher? Go to the Catholic Church. The Pope claims to be infallible. Amen. Of course, you have to deal with him playing around with your little children. No. But other than that, you want, he's infallible. He said he is. I spent 21 years in the church. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, what, you know what you do here with that axe in your back? You know what you do? Well, if that's Christianity, forget about it. Look, I'm going on. Where do you go? <laughs> back to the pool. Yes? yes? Anybody ever been stabbed before? Sure. I got so many holes in my back because I can't condition back here. <laughs> All right. Well, if you want, you want the bond of perfectness, Seven is the perfect number, seven notes on the scale, seven colors of a rainbow. You want to be you want to be perfect spiritually? Charity is the bond of perfectness. Okay, neighbor, add to your brotherly kindness. Can't move until you get the axe in your back. That's that's the ticket to go if you want to go. Gotta wait to the axe. Oh, I got it. You going back? Or are you going that way? Add to your brotherly kindness. Charity. Now, here is where you reach after the lost, completing the whole cycle. You continue to serve God's people, and now you're reaching out to the, to the lost people with the gospel. And if you can keep on serving God with that axe in your back, you have so arrived. Amen. You know what Pillar 7 is? Amen. Just go watch the movie with John Wayne standing down there with the spear playing Cornelius in the greatest story ever told movie. You know, he's looking at the cross. And he looks up, and what does he say? What, coordinate, what, what, the, what the Roman centurion said. Surely this is the Son of God. Why? Because he's up there with the axe in his back, and he's saying, Father, forgive them. Amen. But they don't know what they do. He persevered, and he got to the finishing line. It is finished. And when, God, when people can see you serving the Lord after you've been hurt, what they see is the truth in its personification. Paul said, you are living epistles, known and read of all men. You're living epistles. You are the truth. Anybody want to get there? Can't get there without getting a knife in the back. What's it say in 1 Corinthians 13? Charity endureth all things. Charity suffereth long. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Charity never Faith. Now abide in faith, hope, and charity. Faith says, have Shabbat, Meshach, and Abednego. We know our God can deliver us. Hope says, I hope he will. Charity says, if he don't, we're still not bound now. We're still going to go forward. This is where God wants you. I hope you make it, neighbor. I'm all done. Maybe you want to see what charity is. Give you one last verse and we'll quit. First John 4, and we'll quit. First John 4, I told you charity and love are not the same thing, no matter what those dumb modern Bibles will say. First John chapter 4, just a couple of verses. Verse 17. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein, with inside God. Herein is our love, what? Made what? Perfect. perfect. Charity is the bond of perfection. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. You can love people without giving, but you can't, you can't give without having perfected love. This is where God wants you to be. He wants you to keep it. You, know you know what love is? What charity is? Continuing to serve God with an axe in your back. That's what charity really is. Continuing its perfected love. All right, I'm done with this. I'm really done with this. I got a lady that's in the state of New York. She's a preacher's wife. Her husband and I have been friends for a long time. I helped ordain him. He's a, he's a wonderful man. He was a mortgage banker or a mortgage broker. I mean, uh, mortgage lender before he got uh, into the ministry. Sharp enough man. Gave it up to serve God. And, but he and his wife have, man, they've been through it. They've been through it. 
they got they got three three children, three girls. Listen, neighbor, you think you got problems? One of the three girls runs off with a girlfriend, breaks mama's heart, becomes a lesbian. Second girl runs away from home as a teenager. Matter of fact, comes up to this part of the country right here. Matter of fact, I think the state of New Hampshire. Just ran away from home like a, like a hippie girl, teenage girl. You know, living with the wrong path, comes home a couple of two, three years later, 2,000 tattoos and rings, you know. I wouldn't dare say their names and tell you where they're from. Because I love the whole family. I just want you to know some folks have some burden, maybe it's bigger than you have. Third child has multiple sclerosis, gets married, and she stayed faithful in the church, you know what I mean? The other two girls were gone. And she stays faithful in the church, and then she married some guy, and Guy had a problem with the girl's daddy and mom, the parents, and pulled the daughter away. And, and now the preacher friend of mine and his heartbroken wife never get to see their third daughter. And I guess they got a child at least three, four years old. I hope we've seen them in three or four years. You know, that's just a woman's heart. Every woman here loves God. By the way, the preacher's wife that I'm talking about, she's struggling with multiple sclerosis through this herself. And at least another disease, if not two more, and I can't remember what they are. She's a mess physically. With all this heartbreak on top. Then they were in their church, a rented church preacher, very busy part of the country, you know, expensive area. They got, their building got flooded out, and they had to move, and the guy decided to shut it down and wouldn't rent it out anymore. So now they're, they're having church in their house. And they're getting ready to foreclose on the house. Because the money's been tight. Anybody home? Boy, they're having a hard time. This woman's got a big family, all Catholics. None of them want to hear the gospel. She's all alone in the world. But she's as faithful as she can be to her husband. Wonderful Christian woman. She wrote a poem and sent it to me one day. And I'm going to quit with it. And I want you to hear it and get a blessing from it. And we're going to quit now. All I want you to do is think about your own house now, okay? All you should have been doing was taking inventory. How's your pillars? Listen, you think you have problems? Think of this lady tonight, and I'll close with this. The title of her poem is, The Greatest of These is Charity. Getting saved is the easiest thing to do. But to be called a Christian, the Lord expects more. Saying, I love you, Lord, is nice, but it doesn't mean much if you really want to know. It's like a sounding brass that disappears. Then, oh, where did it go? Mm. Having faith is where it begins. For without it, you cannot please the Lord. Rejoicing in hope with the brethren, waiting for him to come, singing with one accord. But faith and hope will soon come to an end. When in the rapture, we will transcend its charity, which is the greatest of all. Having this, we will never fall. It's not just a word like love, you see. It's our love in action, living and suffering for the one who died for you and me. Charity will never vanish away. If it's there to conform us to his glorious image someday. Charity believeth, hopeth, and endureth all things. Christ demonstrated all when he died and rose again. The key of death he brings. I encourage you all to stay in the fight and take hardness as a good soldier. Put on your armor. I can almost weep and I know these people are so sweet. Bless you, Lord. I'm telling you, they're so sweet. Listen, 90% of their church had COVID-19 two months ago. Including the blind lady that sits over here. And her husband reads her all. It's over here. Put on your arm. Press forward. Don't look over your shoulder. The road is long and hard, but we must reach the end. It's our charity that the Lord will command. Charity is the bond of perfectness that makes us one with Christ. When he shall appear, then we shall appear before him 
as his pure chaste love. So, here's the question. How much do you love the Lord? Will you truly die for him? I don't think so. If living for him, slim. Mm. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. So that we can have the recording. Okay, that's it. We're done. I've had a wonderful time. I've had a wonderful time here. I've said it every night. You've had nothing but a good spirit every night. I haven't had a bad service yet. Okay? So you know, the decisions made through the week, many of you, Tuesday night, you couldn't have got up on all the altar shoe on. Okay? So this is not Jonestown. We don't have Jonestown education. How many of you love America? If you love America, come to your home. We don't do that. But New England is a stiff part of the country. And they were joking Tuesday night. Now it's out you can spit and people jump and get saved. People live on the altar of Southern Shore. They run the aisles right all over the building. Jump in the, I had a guy the other day in North Carolina jumped in the baptistry. There's no water. Head first went into the baptistry. And he, has, and he has an English degree from Berkeley, University of California. Anybody home? You ought to be comfortable at the altar. Don't be stiff about it. Don't be like it's a, you know, people are looking at me. I look at somebody that never went to the altar one day. But, but we've had a good week. We've had a good week. God may have given you everything you needed to have. God may have given you everything you needed this week by now. But some of you may have gotten something special. Everybody okay tonight? You okay? You got the first pillar in place? Uh, you know? You got the second pillar in place? Knowledge? You got temperance in place? You got virtue in place? You got, uh, you know, patience in place, number four? How about godliness, number five? How about brotherly kindness, six? How about that charity, seven? Anything? Is everything okay? I wonder how many say, preacher, I'm not even going to ask you which one it is. I've had invitations when I'm gone to each pillar. Let's just have a shotgun invitation at the end. How many say, preacher, somewhere along the trail, God really spoke to me about one of those pillars that's not right in my life. I mean, I think, I think the God of heaven as you preach this message today, ask, ask Carol if I didn't go up, come upstairs before I got here and grab two sermons on the rapture. And I thought that's what God wanted. But he impressed me to preach this right now. I got here tonight. So did he impress me to preach it for you? I guess you're the only one that knows. Did he speak to you tonight? I don't mean he blessed you and you learned some things. But did he say, hey man, maybe you're not even at that first pillar because you're hanging out with that wrong crowd. Or you got a million bad habits. Or you're taking this for granted or this for granted, right? Well, you, you're not taking care of it. You learn some things, but you're greedy with your time. And you're not ministering to the people you could be helping now. Because God's taught you some things. Or well, you're ready to jump out of that fire, or you want to even go into the fire, right? Are you still back at the pool hall? I mean, did he speak to you about anything real specific where you know he, that you, he wants a change in your life as a result of the message tonight? And you'd like to affect that change tonight with him. If that's you, would you raise your hand nice and high? Last invitation. God bless you. Nobody's looking. God bless you. No, thank you. Hey, we've had a good time all week. I don't have to beat you over the head. We're, we're close now. We're, we're, we're Second time I've been here. I've been invited back already next year. Wonderful. Is there anyone else here, preacher? God took me down a rabbit trail. It's got nothing to do with any of the things you've mentioned in this invitation. God snuck up on me and spoke to me about a completely unrelated matter. But I've got to do business with him about that. I didn't raise my hand with these others. They include me in the invitation. That's who you are. God bless you, Miss. Anybody else? Isn't that nice? Why do you think I act so silly up here? I've got two books on the table, 900 pages of peace, peace that took me 12 years to write. I'm not a dummy. Why do I act like a dummy up here? Because I want to be on, I want to be like Trump, blue collar billionaire. I was introduced one time as a, a blue collar scholar on the I want to be right down where all the people live. Because that's where I was when I got saved. I care about you tonight. You know that. Is there anyone else? Anybody here not sure that you're saved tonight? Say, preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Here's my hand. Did you raise your hand if you're not sure about that? His home folks here that thing. God bless you. It's a good crowd in there. Okay. I'll, how about if we close out this way? I'll stand, I'll say a little prayer. And then when I finish praying again, we'll stand. 
and the invitation will play. If you raise your hand, if you didn't raise your hand, you should. You want one last shot at that altar. You know what an altar is? Most important place in the Bible is <coughs> the sacrifices are made. People give up things, destroy beautiful things for God. Perfect animals. Why don't you tell God what you want to give to Him tonight if He spoke to you? Father, I pray you'll bless this closing invitation, this last service of the week. What a good time we've had. Help us to get into that house of wisdom tonight. Help us get our pillars in place. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Head back in high school. Let's stand. And the altar is open to you. Thank you.